We often have that juxtaposition in the evening chant. The world is swept away, it does not endure, offers no shelter, there is no one in charge. The world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. It's insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. That's the one contemplation. And then we chant, May I be happy. At first glance it may seem hopeless. Everything changes so much. Where are we going to be able to base our happiness? It's precisely because we want happiness in spite of the world, the way the world is, that we've come to meditate. We're going to look inside, because as the Buddha pointed out, there's a potential here for finding true happiness, a happiness that doesn't change on you, happiness that causes no harm to anyone at all. So we have that first set of chants to remind ourselves of the reality. There's so many things you're trying to do in the world, and they just get washed away. So you come to look inside. But the problem is the mind tends to go back and look outside often. So we have that chant every night before the meditation to remind ourselves, okay, this is what you're going to find if you go out thinking about the world. Get swept away. Because as the Buddha said, if you want to get the mind into concentration, there are two things you've got to do. One is to keep focused on what he calls the body in and of itself. That's the body as you have it right here, and not the body in the world. You're not concerned with how it looks. You're not concerned with how strong it is, how young it is. Just concerned with, well, what is it like having a body right here, right now? The other thing you've got to do is put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Keep the mind on one topic. You have to remind yourself that there's nothing out there really worthy of greed or worthy of distress. And that's why we have these contemplations. You leave right here. Where are you? You're back in the world. Is that really where you want to be? Because in the Four Noble Truths, as the Buddha explains, the world is not the problem, and it's not the solution to the problem. The problem is the suffering we have in our minds. And that, he says, comes from within. We hear the Four Noble Truths so many times, over and over again. We often don't think about how radical they are. The Buddha is basically saying the things that you hold on to most dearly are suffering. And the reason you hold on is because of craving. That's the cause for suffering. You can't blame your suffering on situations outside. As he points out, if the mind is trained, you can be with any situation outside and not suffer. If it's not trained, then no matter how good things are outside, you're going to be suffering still. And then in the third Noble Truth, the Buddha says that there is a dimension that is not fabricated at all. It's something you can experience if you train the mind. I know a lot of people who find that hard to believe. After all, they say we're conditioned beings and all we can know are conditions. We can't know anything unconditioned. But as the Buddha pointed out, if you define yourself, you limit yourself. Say, I'm this person, I'm, and people are like this and that, and they have these powers. They don't have those powers. You haven't really explored the powers that you have, and yet you already place limits on them. His approach was the other way around, to figure out, well, what can a human being do? And for the time being, bracket any ideas of who you are, what yourself is, and see, how can the mind be trained? What can the mind do? And by finding that the mind can train itself to gain something unfabricated, then he turned around and looked at, well, what kind of idea of self is going to be conducive to that? And he never formulated a 
theory of self so, so much, but he did say in a few sketches that you are capable of doing this. And if you really have concern for yourself, you'll want to do this. It's not really a self-theory, it's more like a self-sketch. Just enough sense of yourself that, okay, this is going to be a good thing to do. And then finally, in the Fourth Noble Truth, the Buddha says, there is a path of practice to take you to that dimension. In the centuries afterwards, people raise the question, well, if that dimension is not fabricated, then how can a path of practice take you there? And the image they, they arrived at was, well, after all, the Buddha said this is a path there. He didn't say that the path causes the deathless, but it is a path, and the path will take you there. The same way that the road to the Grand Canyon doesn't cause the Grand Canyon, but you follow the road and you get there. So each of the Four Noble Truths is pretty radical. Now they challenge a lot of our preconceived notions about ourselves. I was teaching a group of people about karma one time, and this is a group of people who had been to many Buddhist retreats. And after the, the end of the talk, one woman came up and she said, well, maybe, maybe my life has not been preordained by my DNA. I said, that's right. That's the teaching on karma is that you shape your life. You have it within your power to shape your life. And the mind is not just a, a result of physical events. As the Buddha said in, in the very first verse in the Dhammapada, the mind is a forerunner of all things. All things are achieved through the mind. It's the mind that comes first. And that's the opposite of what a lot of people think nowadays. So the Four Noble Truths are radical. They ask that you make some assumptions about what human beings are capable of doing, and also some assumptions about where you should look for the cause of your suffering. I know a lot of people would like to blame their suffering on conditions outside. But again, the Buddha said that's not where you're going to solve the problem. Because how are you going to solve the problem? Like making conditions outside perfect? Is that how you're going to put an end to suffering? When has the world ever been perfect? When is it going to be perfect? It resists perfection. But we can make up our minds that we want to find perfection inside. That's a choice we can make, and we can carry it through. So you think in these terms, and this gives you reason to want to stay with the breath. Then we have those other reflections to remind yourself of why you don't want to go out in the world. That chant we had just now came from a dialogue. In between a young monk and a king. The king was curious. This young monk had come from a good family. His relatives are still alive. He's wealthy. And he had gone forth. He said usually he found people who went forth because of poverty or loss of relatives or loss of health. But none of those was true in the case of this monks. So I asked the young monk, why did you go forth? Why did you become a monk? And the monk answered with these Dhamma summaries. The first one, the world is swept away, it does not endure. He illustrated that point with a question to the king. When you were young, were you strong? And the king said, yes, I didn't see anyone who was my equal in strength. Of course, being a king back in those days meant you just didn't just sit around, you were actually a warrior. How about now? Well, no, now I'm 80 years old. Sometimes I mean to put my foot one place, I go someplace else. The young monk said, that's why he said the world is swept away, it does not endure. Something you thought was so solid, so reliable, it starts failing you. The world offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. You're going to ask the king, do you have a recurring illness? And the king had what he called a wind illness, shooting pains in his body. 
and sometimes he was so racked with pain, all I could do was lie in bed. And his courtiers had gathered around and they were saying, maybe this time he'll die, maybe this time he'll die. Imagine that. You're racked with pain and that's all they can think of, maybe he'll die this time. And then your monk asked the king, well, can you tell the courtiers to take some of your pain and share it so you don't have to feel so much? Well, no. The king admitted that he would have to feel all the pain himself, so you can't be in charge of your, of your pain. When the pain comes, there's no shelter against it. Then the statement, the world has nothing of its own. Here the king argued, I have treasures stored away in caves and in vaults. How do you say the world has no, nothing of its own? And the other one asked him, all that treasure you have, when you die, can you take it with you? No, the king said, I have to leave it behind. That's why the monk said, the world has nothing of its own. Your ownership is, at best, temporary. And if you ask the things that belong to you, or that you say belong to you, who do you belong to? They have no sense that they belong to you. Even your own body doesn't have any sense that it belongs to you. It does what you tell it to up to a point, and then when it decides to stop working, it doesn't ask permission. It doesn't give you any forewarning. It just does its thing. So there are the teachings, basically about aging, illness, death, which form the basis for the teachings that the Buddha gave on inconstancy, stress, and not self. As he basically said, if something is inconstant, it's going to be stressful. If it's stressful, is it really worth holding on to as you as your, or yours? Now, if there were nothing else in the world besides these inconstant things, you'd say, well, hold on to the best I can. But he's saying if, if you let go of these attachments, you'll find that there's a, a happiness that is not conditioned. That's better than the happinesses that you can find in the world. Then it's worth saying, well, let's try that better happiness. But then we get to that fourth contemplation. The world is insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. The young monk asked the king, you rule over a prosperous country, right? Right. Suppose someone were to come from the east and say there's a kingdom there, lots of wealth, lots of things you could take, and its army is very weak. You could take it if you wanted. Would you go for it? And here the king's 80 years old. He's just been made to think about how inconstant, stressful, how not self his life has been, all the places he's looked for happiness. Yet still he says, yes, I'd go for that. This is what's maddening about human beings. We can see the drawbacks of the world, but we just keep coming back anyhow. Then the young monk asked him if there were another kingdom to the south, one to the west, one to the north. How about a kingdom on the other side of the ocean? Would you go for that one too? Yes. As long as we're looking for our happiness out in the world, there's never enough. So as you sit here focused on the breath, remind yourself this is why we have these contemplations, is to cut down any feelers that the mind sends out into the world. Saying, well, how about thinking about this? You've got a whole hour here. Surely you can take five minutes to think about this, that, whatever. But then there are these contemplations to remind you, well, what are you looking for? You're looking for trouble. You're looking for disappointment. Is that really what you want? When you can get a strong enough sense that, at least right now, I don't need to go there. Then you're more willing to put in the, whatever effort is required to get the mind to settle down and feel at home here. As long as the pleasures of the world seem easy and the concentration seems hard, you're going to sneak off to the easy pleasures. So you've got to keep reminding yourself again and again and again that those easy pleasures come with a big price. And even though the concentration may be onerous, don't think of it as onerous. Think of it just as a skill you're working on. 
You know, there's pleasures in the world no matter how much you think about them. They're never enough. Whereas those who have completed the path and found that there really is a source of true happiness inside. So you get to the, what they call the land of enough. Something that doesn't have to be done for the sake of anything else. It's the sake of for which we practice. We can arrive at a completion. So think about that every time you meditate. In that way it makes it a lot easier to cut off those little feelers that go out. You want to probe the world here, probe the world there, see what you can think about here, think about there, and turn those feelers back in. How about probing around in the breath, probing around in the state of your mind, how you're focused? That kind of exploration is really worthwhile.